morning, everybody. A very interesting dynamic in this um, in this Gospel of Saint Luke, which is when the angel Gabriel went to Luke and said, "This is the news. You're going to have a child." He expressed a kind of confusion, right? Didn't Zechariah the priest express a kind of confusion? And um, then the angel Gabriel came to St. Mary and he gave her the same news that she would have a child and she expressed likewise a kind of confusion. But it seems like the outcome for Zechariah was very different of the discussion than for St. Mary. Would you, guys, would you all agree? If you remember, Zechariah said, how shall I know this? And the angel said, I am Gabriel. And he struck him dumb, which now all our kids think the word dumb means you're not smart. But actually, the original meaning of the word dumb means you can't speak. Uh, but in St. Mary's case, he said, OK, I will tell you what happened. If we read the Bible carefully, we think about that for a second. Why? did the Archangel Gabriel react completely differently to two different people? It all had to do with their attitude. Their attitude towards God and the angel. When the angel came to Gabriel, he said, how shall I know this? Right? He probably thought to himself, I am the, the priest of the congregation. I am the... I didn't, sorry. I just saying, you know, I'm I'm the the priest of the temple, and I'm I I sh I know better, and I know everything, and I'm in control. And Saint Mary asked very reasonably, how is it going to happen? What are the mechanisms? How is the steps that's going to happen? So this is kind of giving us a clue that God welcomes our approach to Him. God welcomes our discussion to Him, but. When we send or we try to send the message that I am in 100% control in my life, that the way I call the shots is how things are going to go, and I know better for myself, God, this is not a good approach to God. And this is not a productive approach to God. In fact, if you look in the Old Testament, there were many, many figures who disagreed with God, and not only did they live in the time of God's dealing in a strong way, but actually God changed his mind. Remember Abraham, he argued with God about the, the fate of the people of Israel, of Sodom and Gomorrah. Moses interceded for the people of Israel, and God averted. And we, my friends, cannot read the Psalms, which is a very important part of our life as Copts, without feeling what pe people feeling what we feel, the true feelings that we feel, deep, honest questions of people in pain, of people in confusion and abandonment and loss. Think in David the prophet when he said, my God, my God, why? Right? Has the Lord's steadfast love ceased? Has God forgotten? Why do you cast my soul away? And, and there are benefits to such a debate with God. Number one, for us to debate and to have such a relationship with God, number one, we are acknowledging that God is distinct from us. Okay? Life is not just automatic and we just do what we feel like and whatever comes up, comes up, and however people act, we react. And we just going through life reactive. No. God is distinct from us. God is a distinct person. And we are very clear in our beliefs that God is a personal God, that God is a person. God is a person to be addressed. Different, obviously, than a human person. But we understand God is a person. Distinct from you. That God is distinct from you. Second, when we talk to God, we come face to face with our misconceptions about God, 
our misconceptions about his purpose for our life, who he, what he wants for us. We have to face these things when we enter into a discussion with our God. It's another benefit. Finally, the honesty and the courage of deep questions that we present to God in the quietness of our room, of our bedroom, shows God that we trust him to hear us. When, when you get into a stage in life when you are going to be married, okay, and a person speaks to you, the implication when they speak to you is they trust you that you're at least going to consider what they say. It is one of the most important parts of friendship is I'm going to tell you how I feel because I trust you to listen to me, to consider what I'm saying. And these are important messages that we communicate between us and our God. If we open uh, Psalm 143, I know we have this feature here in Oakland. We can open the, uh, can we? Okay. It's the first time I ever did this in my life. Psalm 143. <laughs> and I only want to read uh, a piece of it. Just a piece, okay? In verse 1, he says, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. In your faithfulness, answer me and in your righteousness. And then going down to verse 7. And we're so fast. <laughs> Answer me speedily. O Lord, my spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, lest I be like those who go down to the pit. Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning. For in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk. For I lift up my soul to you. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. In you I take shelter. And then finally, teach me. This is important. If anybody fell asleep, please come back. Teach me to do your will. For you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. So I want to look at three parts of this because this is important in how we practically exercise our relationship with God. What did David want? How did he propose to get it? And how did he debate and argue with God? First, looking at the psalm, we see what did David want. Okay. He wanted to be heard and to be answered. Again, look for your practice in your relationship with the people in your life. Your husband, your wife, your children, your parents. You want to be heard. And it's a very important f function of parents to know. Okay, I'm still a very junior parent, so I'm not trying to be a parental teacher here, but it's important for our kids to feel that we care what they have to say. And the same thing. David wanted to be heard and answered by his God. David's relationship with God was very close. And this is the relationship that the Bible teaches us to have with God. So just a desire to be heard. Then the rest of his beliefs fall into two things. Two important things, they're both important, okay? Sometimes we think only one is important. His desire for safety and godliness. Not just safety, okay? Cause me the way... I should go. Teach me to do your will, to walk in a righteous path. Okay? And here's the lesson, friends. Here's the lesson. Whenever we ask God for a material thing, for something material, get me this, get me out of this, help me with this, that is fine because that shows God that he's our father and we are his children. But they should always, our prayers, my dear friends, should always include a plea for our own moral transformation, our spiritual transformation. Help me to walk in the smooth path. Help me to walk in your way. 
Help me to be good, to be kind, to be holy. Help me to be righteous. Our prayers should be mixed. If our, exist, if our prayers, my friends, if, if all his prayers that David, that he had, were dominated by his existence to live, to survive, to kill his enemies. If you guys know, David, his job was a warrior. If you, if you, of course, I hope we all here know all of David's jobs here, right? His job was a warrior. He was, he was in battle, okay? And so he was constantly asking God for victory in battle, for survival. His survival was always at stake. But those thoughts, and that's what I'm asking all of us, did not so dominate his mind that he forgot the point of living. Right? I know you young guys are not thinking about the point of living yet. You're thinking of fun things, which is good. Right? But his thoughts did not dominate his mind so that all he wanted to do was feel that this life is the end goal. And he was a king, and he was wealthy, and he had everything you could imagine. That he knew there were reasons to live that justified staying alive in the first place. To do God's will. How many of us here, how many of us, it's, an, it's a rhetorical question, but how many of us here really think, do I know what God's purpose is for me, for my life? Do I just know the steps for surviving? Do I just know the steps for earning a living? Do I know just the steps for winning all the political battles at work? Do, know I, do I know all the steps just to make sure that whenever my wife or my husband tells me I did something wrong, I have a fast answer? Is all that I want is to survive? Or do I think that I have a purpose to live? that I have a purpose for others. Look at the news all around you if you don't think that that's enough. Even if you think I'm just telling you this because I'm telling you this. Look at the news and look at all the people that have everything that you could ever pray for materially. Look on the news. And yet their life is full of conflict. They are full of unhappiness. Everything you could ever pray for. And their lives are full of conflict and unhappiness. I'm not going to name anybody's names. You can look at the news. It will come today. It will come tomorrow. Okay? I don't have to tell you anybody. Just watch. And you will find people who have everything materially that you could ever pray for. And yet their lives and their relationships are so broken. Why? Because the point of life is not just to grab all those things. I actually enjoy, as an aside, reading biographies. If that's something you like to do, I do it because I like to learn. Okay? I'll give you one example of somebody who's not here anymore. I was interested in the biography of Princess Diana, of all people. Why? I'm not a princess. I don't live in England. Because... She, her husband gave her a very hard time, frankly. And my life growing up, I had all the best examples of the best men in my life. I know exactly what a good man is from 360 degrees, 720 degrees, and every, every multiple of 360, I know what a good man is. But I wanted to know what is a bad man? What is a husband who lets his wife down? Where, where do I have to watch out? And I think we all should be cognizant of being interested in biography to learn, to grow. And so you can test your spiritual temperature when you pray. If all that you want is safety and survival, this isn't a good level of spirituality. 
If we ask God, if our prayers are seasoned with prayers to be more joyful, to be more kind, okay, to be more loving, to be more patient, if those are part of our prayers, that is a good sign, my friends, that we are, have a decent spiritual temperature, not just to get out of this financial pinch, to win this argument, to get out of this health situation, which are also very important, but to bring glory to God and to be good and kind and decent people that want others to be close to God. And finally, he asked, deliver me from my enemies, in verse 9. And sometimes, you know, when we read the Psalms and we hear about David and his enemies and praying for his enemies, we feel it's kind of historical and come on. You know, this is not really our life in tranquil suburban uh, America, northern New Jersey. I don't know if we have a lot of enemies ready to storm our house and uh, take our uh, blender, okay? Right? Maybe. I don't know. If anybody here, their blender got stolen, I apologize, okay? But the point is, when we pray the Our Father, what do we say? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Never forget that there is always our enemy, Satan, who is always trying to undermine our relationship with God, our spiritual life. So finally, what can be our last point here is what are our practical steps? Let's each of us, my friends, search our heart for our motivation and, an, and our attitude in approaching God, in our prayers, in our spiritual life. What is our goal in our prayers? Search just you and yourself. What is my motivation? What is my attitude? Second, as you discuss with God, have a conscious realization of important things. God is present, that he listens and cares, and he loves and desires to bless you. And finally, when all of this struggle and pain between you and, and God has concluded, thank him that you have grown towards him in the whole process. To whom be the glory, both now and ever, unto the ages of the age.